mission to ride his motorcycle from Hong Kong to Brisbane, Australia on a voyage that will see him travel through 10 countries and in the process raise awareness about 10 of the most important charities across the region. It's an adventure that will test his limits during a trip that will be exciting, dangerous, eye-opening and always breathtaking. Join him each week as he travels wheel to wheel. With Hong Kong and China now firmly behind him, Morgan is now en route to the Vietnamese border. Welcome to motorbike heaven, Vietnam. My third country on the wheel-to-wheel -wheel expedition boasts one of the highest motorcycle populations in the world. It was also my first real experience of dealing with chaotic traffic. A delightful, death-defying dance. You bump fenders, you keep going. You take someone out, you keep going. You see blood, you close your eyes and move on. I don't think it's that these guys are crazy, they're just a little bit different. In fact, they're pretty talented bike riders because they're able to control the bike so effectively in very, very difficult circumstances. So their skill level is amazingly high. Frankly, it was a relief just to be here. Travelling from one communist country to another is quite dramatic. On the one hand, the Chinese officials were politely reserved while checking everything extremely carefully. The conduct of all the officials throughout the whole process over the last few days has been absolutely stellar. No complaints whatsoever, everyone's been polite. Across the border, the Vietnamese border guards were giddy at the size of my bike. Four long hours later, I was finally in Vietnam. I hit the road to Ha Long Bay on the northern coast. But the wet conditions and dark, winding roads made the trip treacherous. My slick tyres, designed for smooth, sealed roads, didn't help. And neither did the huge lorries throwing up mud at me. I began to visualise flying back to Hong Kong in a body bag. But I vowed to keep going. The film crew were waiting for me in Ha Long Bay on the way to Animals Asia, and I was looking forward to a hearty meal. I feel like I've, I've added a completely new dimension to my whole self. Um, you know, it's like I didn't understand the way things were before, and I feel, I know that sounds strange, but I feel like the whole experience has enlightened me a lot. After a week of hardcore riding, it was time for good food and a beer. Time to get off the bike and be a tourist. I'd wanted to travel to Ha Long Bay all my life. The beauty of this UNESCO World Heritage Site was like nothing I'd ever seen. Stark limestone islands, virtually uninhabited by humans, rise out of the calm waters of the Gulf of Tonkin. I certainly understood why the Vietnamese chose the name Ha Long, which means descending dragon. It is kind of cool to have these misty, wintry conditions that really adds to the whole theatre of this cauldron that we're in amongst these limestone peaks. Joining me on this part of the expedition was Pete Murray, a long-term resident of Vietnam and a professional fixer. He's the man I had to thank for getting my bike and I across the border. I don't think anyone realises how many ministry departments and, and different officialdom areas have to, be, have to be gone into to get this stuff to happen. I mean, you've got police permits, Ministry of Transportation, uh, the Vice Minister signed your documents, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Press Centre um, are responsible for sponsoring your presence here. Uh, it's all, you know, absolutely a first time. Our boat took us around just a fraction of the thousands of small and large outcroppings in this shallow bay. Each island is unique and contains its own ecosystem from tropical forests to caves to coral reefs. With the help of several marine protection programs, How Long Bay has become a hotspot for conservation. But like any popular tourist destination, it struggles to cope with overdevelopment. As I admired the strange but beautiful landscape, I wondered how this environment could ever survive the inescapable impact of humans. 
My first week on the road changed me in ways I was only beginning to understand. The monumental experiences and challenges evoked a time-lapse feeling, as if I'd closed my eyes for a second and woken up many years later. It seems that uh, everything I've done so far is pretty much the first time that ever it's ever happened. First individual person ever to go across the Hong Kong-China border on a motorbike and then again the first person to ever legally uh, go across the China-Vietnam border on a motorbike of the size that I'm riding. So it's been a lot of firsts, it's taken a lot of help uh, from local people who have been a great support. Um, and it's yielded some really unique experiences for me. The ride thus far had been exhilarating. However, my next encounter with our designated charity Animals Asia was going to plunge me into a whole new world of shock, horror and hope. I rode down a quiet country road a few hours outside of Hanoi to the Tam Dao National Park. I was going to start my journey at the Happy Ending, the bear sanctuary operated by Animals Asia. Here, in a beautiful forested valley, Asiatic black bears that were once caged and tortured for their bile live out their days doing what normal bears do, eating, sleeping and playing. Now entering a semi-natural enclosure, which is 2,500 square meters. Um, in this enclosure, we hold 21 bears, and every day around nine o'clock, we let them outside. Um, our team has to set up food and enrichment for the bears, um, and they'll spend the whole day outside um, foraging for food, um, playing with the toys we've given them. After Anna Marie and I got safely out of the way, the bears were released and quickly took over the enclosure. In an instant, I could see how healthy and engaged they were. Anna Marie explained how the staff created different challenges for the bears every day to mimic their life in the wild. What sort of interaction do the bears have whilst they're in this enclosure? Um, you'll see later on that the first half an hour to an hour is most likely spent just foraging for food. And they later, do that on an indivi individual basis? Individual oh. basis. There is a couple of bears that really seem to like each other and spend a lot of time foraging together, but in general they do go their own way. Right. And then once they're satisfied with having found everything that's in the enclosure, they'll start playing with each other. And in this group, we're actually quite lucky that most of them interact very well together. So they have lots of friends to play with and they love wrestling. It was encouraging to see how Animals Asia staff could forge such close bonds with their bears. Despite all they'd suffered, each bear had a personality and spirit of its own. Some docile, some headstrong, some, like this little girl, Mischievous. This one's name is Marmite. I think it should be called Vegemite. Animals Asia operates across Asia with a determined focus on ending cruelty to animals. Led by their inspirational founder, Jill Robinson, the charity has rescued and rehabilitated hundreds of bears. Walking onto a bear farm for the first time in my life in 1993 when I was already working in animal welfare in Asia, but I I can honestly say I'd never seen anything so hideous as that first day with bears in cages, psychotic, um, physically damaged beyond all comprehension with the most incredible wounds across their bodies and of course realising ultimately that they could so easily and cheaply be replaced, you know, in terms of the use of their bile which is used in traditional Chinese medicine. The Bear Sanctuary employs dozens of local people who, before they join Animals Asia, often know little about what the bears have been through. A lot of people come here have no idea what they're in for, so most of them come from farming backgrounds, but all the training is really done here, and sometimes you think, like we've spoken initially to people who do dog farming and all of that, like breeding, and they think we're breeding bears here and all, but the, the key is that these people initially will actually 
think that. They come here and then see what the bears have gone through. And especially after they've gone through a couple of rescues where they've seen bears arrive and then see them rehab, like rehabilitate, then their passion really starts. Oh, yes. And then they become your greatest local spokespeople, I guess. Exactly. During my time at the sanctuary, I was also put to work. In the treatment room, Jill and veterinarian Kirsty introduced me to Moggy, who was getting a routine checkup. First, Kirsty sedated the bear and conducted a thorough exam. She's one of our older girls who's been here since almost the start of the when the centre started here. Yeah. She's very recognisable because she's missing her left front paw, um, which we can only assume did this injury happen when she was caught in the wild in a snare trap. It's a very typical injury. Um, so, yep, we assume she's a bear that's been poached from the wild some years ago. Because she's been with us for a while, Moggy has already had her damaged gallbladder removed. So today is just a routine check to follow up um, and we just really just do a methodical yeah. check over, do blood tests, check all her, her limbs, check her, her abdomen. We'll do an ultrasound of her abdomen and just make sure that she hasn't got any changes to her liver, which we sometimes see ongoing. Um, we'll check her teeth, we'll do dental work if necessary, we'll check her eyes, etc. So just a very thorough full health check. After Moggy got the all clear, Jill showed me how to cut her nails. That's hard. It's that quite hard, you know, it's fine, it's yeah. fine. It's just, it's, some of them are really, really tough to do. Oh, no. Often we see they, they continue to grow into a full circle through really? the pad and they puncture the pad and they come out the other side. It's a full circle and the, the infection and the stink is horrible. The medical community increasingly supports Animals Asia's efforts to stop people using bear bile. Current research shows that synthetic compounds can be just as effective. Plus, bile extracted from unhealthy, diseased bears can often do more harm than good to humans. Being we can create and produce uh, the, uh, the, 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 the component which can also have the same uh, effect. But no need uh, to, to take uh, bear bite because uh, you can get uh, some uh, advantage but you cause a lot of disadvantage. They will get malnutrition, their bile was uh, uh, withdrawn too much, then the quality of this bile is completely changed and contaminated, as I explained to you. So they get more harm than benefit. Animals Asia's Vietnam director, Tuan Ben Dixon, emphasizes education and awareness to reduce demand for bear bile. Unless the, 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 the demand for bear bile is reduced, you know, then we're not going to end the industry. So that's our two main aim of our education uh, program is that, first of all, to highlight the, uh, uh, the profile of the moon bear, you like, you know, the, the plant of the moon bears. And secondly, to convince the public to you know, stop using bear bile, you know, so that you know, we can try and save whatever moon bears left in a while. As I interacted with these magnificent creatures, I couldn't fathom how the bile extraction industry could treat them so cruelly. Rehabilitation was but one part of my education. I wanted to learn more about how Animals Asia opened people's eyes to the torture and how they lobbied governments to outlaw the industry. Most of all, I wanted to see the bile farms for myself. I into a Korean millionaire's house. A guy's gotten rich on bear bile. And we're going to see uh, the bears in captivity that are getting tortured for their uh, gallbladder bile. It's disgusting when you think about it. Inside, I was furious, seething, ready to tear the place apart. But on the outside, I sat quietly, having tea with the owners of a bear bile operation. Jill sat next to me, pleasant and diplomatic. She knew from years of experience that the goal was to get inside to see the bears. The smiles are all the facade. I hate smiling at places like this, but we just give it to you. She'll let us go around and see what we're saying. As calm as could be, the owners led us into the hot and dark shed. 
it's like walking into a hell. It really is. It's, it's incredibly gruesome and sad and it almost felt twisted. It almost felt like a par parallel universe. The place reeked of urine, feces, vomit and fear. This one's wild caught, it's missing its front left. And obviously you can see the world of difference between the bears that we have that have become actually pretty socialized with people and these ones that are just scared stiff knowing what's gonna to happen to their bodies. You can see the look in her eyes. Look at the difference, there's the eyes. Oh yeah, totally. I'd read about it, talked to people, done my research, but nothing could have prepared me for walking into that godforsaken place. It was overwhelming. Simply overwhelming. Believe me, when you're here seeing this, it is absolutely possible to see the stress these bears are under. Anxious, nervous, depressed all at the same time. Oh, he's barely got any teeth. Absolute, total exploitation of another creature. There's 21 bears in this facility. This woman usually has more in here, but she's saying that she can't afford to keep them. Can't afford to feed them. So when we asked her what had happened to the other bears that she had here previously, she, she just said she gave them away to other people so that they could extract the bile from them. The good news is that Animals Asia work continues. More and more bears are being rescued. And like Jill said, even bears that are as traumatized as these ones can be saved and brought back to, to a normality with the right sort of rehabilitation program. We were there for, you know, in, the, in amongst the cages for maybe 20 minutes maximum. And to feel that those 20, what we saw in those 20 minutes, those bears are there 24 seven for 20 years. I mean, it was incredibly sad, really incredibly sad. I had one last stop to make. To complete the circle, I needed to get my hands on the end product. We've, uh, we've seen where the bears are kept and where the bile gets extracted. We're going to now try and find out where the, the bile gets sold. Oh, here we go. We've got some bears. Uh, I'd like to buy some bile. Okay, I told you the door. Right. Maybe we'll try somewhere else. Oh, here's some bears. Do you have any bile? Can we buy some bile, please? What's this? This is bear bile. So this is it. Do I just drink? Uh, all the torture of the bears to get bile ends up in one little jar like this for one US dollar for one cc of bear bile. So the bears we've seen getting extracted, beating their head against the cage, beside themselves with stress, physically ill and eventually dying because of this, ends up here in a bottle. Animals Asia people are really just amazing human beings, you know. They're not just going in there marching and they're being self-righteous. They really are trying to find solutions for everybody there. The farmers, their family, the bears, everybody concerned. We just love getting them from the position where they have no hope on these farms and they're so badly hurt to getting them out into the enclosures. But what we can um, achieve from these rescue centres is the most amazing research programmes in terms of understanding the pathology, getting that information out there in papers, convincing the government, Chinese doctors, Vietnamese doctors, um, academics, the general public, that bear farming is the most hideous and unnecessary programme, I think, in the history of the planet. I actually see a lot of changes um, in the way the, the government uh, 
uh, first of all, introduce new law uh, to help the bears and other wildlife. And secondly, they start to do a bit more law enforcement, although to the, not to the, uh, the level that we expect them to do. Uh, but overall, uh, there is a, a definitely change there. Uh, and as you can see that you know, more bears, uh, more bear farms are being forced to, to follow the regulation and they're actually willing to confiscate more bear from, from the wildlife trade than, than before. Yes. There's no way we're going to give up on this until the very last bear farm has closed. It's what Animals Asia be was begun for, you know, and, and um, you know, we, we have a, a lifelong commitment to, to achieving that. And I think in my lifetime we're going to do just that. It's been a privilege to be here with Jill Robinson and to see the incredibly thoughtful, passionate and intelligent way they're tackling this issue of the illegal milking of bile in Vietnam. There's 71 rescued bears here, all with brilliant personality and I just feel that I really understand the gravity of this situation. There's still 3,000 bears out there being illegally milked. So support Animals Asia, this is a real issue and it's amazing the work that this group is doing. I was back on the bike with mixed emotions. I'd seen a lot of pain and abuse, but the work of Animals Asia inspires me and fuels my passion to go on. To prepare myself for the coming miles, I needed to devote some serious attention to my bike. So I found a street in Hanoi full of garages and friendly grease monkeys ready to help out. 25,000 kilometre expedition, you go through a few tyres. Selecting the right tyres is critical because the expedition has on-road and off-road sections. I bought this bike two years before the expedition so I could get used to it and be at one with it for the adventure. I have still had the same tyres on it since buying it two years ago and these are now completely munted because of the Chinese mud and then the Vietnamese mud that I've been through. These, sh these shouldn't even be working right now and I've been slip sliding all over the place, nearly coming off every five minutes, but I've made it here to Hanoi and the first tire change. Despite being a solo expedition, I could never have been here without the support of my family. In Hanoi, I received a surprise visit from Lavina and Aria. They flew down to Vietnam just to spend one day with me. It was the first time I'd seen Aria since I'd left Hong Kong, so it was great to have her with me. I said goodbye and rode out of Hanoi, heading towards the remote border with northern Laos. It didn't take long to escape the chaos of a million motorbikes. I'm now in rural Vietnam in my chow. It's taken um, a couple of hours to get here from Hanoi and I'm starting to see the beauty of this country. It's really the first opportunity I've had on the entire expedition to get into amazing rice paddy uh, sort of village atmosphere here. This is actually a popular tourist attraction for people coming to the northern part of Vietnam. The riding has been really good. Um, of course, I'm keeping my perfect record of having rain on every single riding day of the entire expedition, which makes visibility a bit hard. But anyway, things are getting better. We're a couple of hours away from the, the Lao border and looking forward to seeing uh, what it's like on the other side. My experience in Vietnam left me with some enormously emotional memories, shaping and changing me like nothing I'd ever experienced before. At my next destination in remote Laos, I was going to open a brand new school, another sanctuary for those in need. Next week, Morgan experiences Hell Day, the toughest ride of his life. Join him as he journeys through Laos in what will prove to be the most action-packed and hair-raising episode of Wheel to Wheel yet.
For more information, please visit wheel2wheel.tv.